Hi everyone, lovely to see some known faces, some unknown faces, but uh, hopefully there will be some more people joining as well, because there were quite a lot of people signed up. A um, couple of practical notes, um, people will be listening also from Zoom, so I understand that people will want to move from one room to another, but if you could kindly pay attention when you stand up, because the, the chairs are very loud. And uh, yeah, for people especially who are listening from, from home, there's just like people slamming things and they don't understand what it is. So if you from home are hearing things slam down, everything is okay here, it's just the chairs. Um, so this is just a little overview of, uh, of immunization and DHIS. Um, of course, we're not here to teach you what immunization is, how immunization works, why is it important or what not. We are more here to focus on uh, how the digital solutions with EHIS have been, uh, um, have been integrated and strengthened the systems and, uh, and uh, how they had um, an impact in the countries that they have been supporting and, uh, and providing uh, information for. Um, I mean, everyone knows here, hopefully, that DHIS2, it's uh, well established as a health information uh, management system, um, both for routine immunization and, of course, with the arrival of COVID, um, was uh, quite a wake-up call for a lot of people. But uh, nowadays, uh, we have more than 45 countries that are using um, DHIS as pretty much a backbone of their immunization programs and uh, national programs for routine, for emergencies, for campaigns and such. Um, so, and, uh, and we have more than 30 that uptake to, uh, uptook it like very quickly for, for COVID. So you see already from the map here that you might also have seen before, like we have spread very quickly and, and, uh, and very rapidly throughout, throughout the globe. And uh, most importantly, some of you might be acquainted with this slide, some others not. Karen is laughing because she knows it very well. Do not get scared. Um, this is just a quick overview of everything that we have, what we say immunization toolkit. Immunization toolkit spans uh, a little bit from uh, um, surveillance down to uh, routine immunizations, some other applications that are fully integrated with EHIS. But of course, we have much more than that. We have triangulation, we have stock, because of course, there's no vaccination without, without vaccines that are carried around here and there, aren't they? And, and we have data use work streams, so trying to understand better how people are using the denominator and the population data in order to have a better overview of their actions and the coverage, just not to have like very skewed um, final uh, indicators, so you can actually make better decisions in the end. And of course, these also trickles down in GIS and population, so we are spending a lot of time and energies in trying to improve our, our maps and the way that we can visualize uh, the information in order to, to have better micro planning for, to decide our, our decisions. And, and of course, um, the, what we have in the, in the toolkit it's, uh, it's just like, a, um, it's, it's, it's a wide range of information that gives us the possibility to monitor our, our, our efforts uh, to inform us uh, in order to have uh, evidence decisions, evidence-based decisions. So we can go from uptake just to coverage, but most importantly, um, we are based in our packages out of standards, out of global standards that can be shared and uptaken quickly from countries and can be adapted afterwards in country to better uh, mirror the context of the country that is uptaking this information. And of course, all the things that we saw before in this flow chart, and then we have on top all these cross-cutting cross tools that we have seen some of them this morning, uh, because we had this presentation this morning. So for example, mobile data capture, improved uh, analytics and dashboard, interoperability, there will be some sessions on interoperability. It's a hot topic, very sexy topic. We're aware of that. And of course, as we said, like this morning as well, mentioned our master facility list and, and target population in order to have a better overview of our targets or what we're doing, where we are doing these, these, these things and why we are doing it there. And uh, I don't want to take too much time actually. Um, so today's presenters are a wide range of, uh, 
of presenters coming from very different areas, actually. It's very interesting to see like how widespread we are nowadays, but most importantly, how we are gonna touch different areas of the, of the immunization toolkit. So we're going to have Dr. Dani Rizzato later from PAHO. And um, it, we are starting a little bit like, um, I envision this a little bit as a journey. So you have like, PAHO that is more like on the conceptual uh, side of things that we are still planning, we're still going ahead, seeing how we can implement this information, especially for um, vaccine safety in the, in the Pan American region. To move then to um, Mali, well, I mean, we have uh, Dr. Suleiman Samake um, for, from uh, Hispo West Central Africa, who is kindly translating these information from, for, from French to English for us. And uh, we are having a, a general overview of how data have changed before and after the implementation of COVID in country. And then we're going to move to um, Mr. Rajat Billy um, from the Malawi Ministry of Health. And we are going to see how um, we can leverage from the beginning uh, of the implementation from COVID also to improve uh, the uptake of information, have this information um, in, uh, for example, here, electronic vaccination certifications, but how we can leverage on previous investment to then improve also our information also for routine um, data. And finally, from, uh, Dr. Pamaj Amakran from his Sri Lanka. Uh, he's of course famous in the DHIS world. Last year we also had uh, a presentation from him because in the end Sri Lanka is one of the countries that had one of the most widespread national uh, implementation, especially for, for COVID. So it was only worth it to continue this story to see from last year we, we were like at the peak of the pandemic when, when we had the, the all virtual um, mm, DAC last year. So to see how it progressed through time and see how it followed up. And now we're going to see, for example, the data quality assessment that they have done after one year of data collection. And hopefully like you will have like a better idea of how countries are implementing uh, these, uh, this toolkit, because in the end, it's, you don't have to be at a uh, hundred percent with everything. You see that there are like a wine range. You can be starting and have just like an aggregate before and after having a quite quick analysis of how your things are improving or not improving, but just like, so you can have a better overview that is centralized in a system up to a very well established implementation like the one in, in Sri Lanka. So I hope it's gonna be quite interesting for you to see different levels, but most importantly, different countries, different type of implementation and different kinds of ideas that these implementations are carrying forward. So I am leaving the stage to Dr. Rizzato and, uh, and, yeah, and the PAHO presentation. Thank you, Vittoria. I hold my seat. Uh, thank you, uh, University of Oslo and all the people involved in this meeting and organizing all the aspects uh, of the presentation, but also in the support of our project. I'm part of the Pan American Health Organization, um, and I will be presenting, as uh, Vittoria said, about the digital transformation of the vaccine safety surveillance in the Americans in the Americas and the role of the HS2. This uh, will be the agenda for the next 15 to 20 minutes. Um, uh, who we are, what's about the adverse event following immunization uh, surveillance, and uh, which was our proposal for the region and for the, the member states. And also, as I said, which would be the role of the DHS2 as a system at the regional level and at the national level. Mm, many of you uh, would know that the Pan American Health Organization is an international organization for the Inter-American system. It's uh, 120 years old. Uh, actually, we are celebrating our anniversary uh, this, this month, uh, but we are also the regional um, unit of the World Health Organization as other regional um, offices that are present here. Uh, and in that case, in, in, in that sense, we are uh, working towards the, um, the, the, the people, uh, health, maintenance, and 
um, improving of their well-being in the Americas. Within this uh, huge challenge, immunization has uh, a really, really big part that has been highlighted during the, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, the recently appointed uh, director of the immunization unit highlighted uh, this role of immunization, not only in, in uh, healthcare, but also in, in general well-being. Um, as we have been uh, saying, we, we didn't gather for the last two years for uh, these uh, DHS2 meetings. So it's partly thanks to uh, immunization and vaccination that we are little by little coming closer to uh, the, the uh, let's say the new normal that wouldn't be the normal, but at least as, as close as possible. Uh, and you must know that uh, besides uh, immunization as a huge tool uh, to tackle the pandemic, there was a huge effort and a, a really quick speed to roll out and develop those vaccines. But on the other hand, we have to take a really close look what on, on uh, secondary effects or possible secondary effects that are uh, named as adverse events following immunization in English. And in Spanish, we, um, in, in the Americas region, we try to uh, call them events supposedly attributable to vaccination or immunization. And this uh, supposedly uh, highlights that it, it could be because of the vaccine or the immunization, but it could be uh, not related to immunization. And that's something interesting uh, to take, uh, to, to be aware that many people uh, is using these figures to, uh, to be a, a, an, an anti-vaxxer or, or to highlight or to uh, battle the vaccine campaigns. So this is uh, somehow, uh, we, we have to be very clear with the information that we are given in the context that we are giving it. And we have to be very clear also with the population because this is a matter of trust. If we have the trust of the people, they will be coming and getting their shots. Um, that's why the Pan American Health Organization, as many other organizations and ministry of, ministries of health across the world, uh, were working in the uh, vaccine safety surveillance, uh, especially during the last two years. So uh, our goal was to build a regional AFI surveillance system uh, on top of what was previously done Usually the AFI information was sent on an aggregate basis and usually was um, something that was updated maybe monthly or three times or four times a year and sometimes yearly. So the information that we have about adverse events was not on real time. And of course, during the pandemic, we needed uh, as many information, as much information as possible, but also on, on a really uh, timely basis to take better decisions and to understand if those vaccines that were basically for good weren't do, doing some harm. Um, but on the other hand, we also wanted to involve the people that was carrying out and, and rolling out these uh, vaccine programs uh, within the Pan American Health Organization, within other regional and international organization, but especially within each country because uh, each country are the real, um, the, the real um, uh, uh, representatives of what we are doing as a regional office. And as I said, the, the core value here was trust. If we can build trust uh, re um, regarding vaccines, then we, we can say that we are doing our job regarding adverse events following immunization surveillance. So uh, more or less two years ago, we started this project within the organization and we uh, tried to understand which was the baseline. And we, we performed the survey and uh, almost every member state uh, happened to, to uh, fill this, this survey and to have some interviews in other cases. 
and we understood what's uh, what's the reality in in this aspect in our region. And because of what I've heard, it's more or less the, the reality of many other places. Almost 60% of the of the countries didn't have uh, an electronic system uh, on on the uh, data gathering part, as, as, as at least they were. Uh, pen and paper based reports, and they were transcribing this information and they, they are doing that uh, still uh, on maybe spreadsheets, Excel sheets, or other basic information systems uh, to aggregate this data. There are other countries, more or less 20%, that they do have information systems in place, but for different reasons, sometimes are political fragmentations, sometimes are uh, different governance uh, between the, the pharmacovigilance areas, the ministries of, of health and immunization areas and so on, that they have like different parts of the uh, adverse event following immunization information. So uh, that it, it's a different challenge besides the one I, I mentioned at the beginning. And there was a, a third group of countries that they, they did have and they do have um, a centralized web and let's say a, a robust information system in place and any other actor in their country that was related to adver adverse events following immunization surveillance was going to uh, send the information or, or to input the information in this system. Nevertheless, even these systems uh, usually don't follow international standards in terms of uh, semantic standards, for example, uh, for vaccines, for adverse events. So there are challenges also in these well-developed countries. Taking this into account, we try to design a plan that could be achievable for the different levels that we find in the different countries, trying to um, follow a, a two-phased uh, approach. So in, in the first phase, we uh, try to gather information as soon as possible, as quick as, as possible, asking every country, every member state to submit a copy of their database in an anonymized way. So they, they shouldn't share personal data regarding identity or, or contact information and so on uh, for, the, for the public health surveillance sake. So they were sharing this information in a really basic way as a shared folders uh, with uh, encrypted uh, keywords and, and, and password, a user and, and, and password to send this information. But at the same time, and, and this is how we have been gathering information for, uh, for the last uh, six to, to 10 months. And uh, almost 20 countries are sending information uh, uh, periodically to us in, the, in this way. Uh, at the same time, we are moving forward to the second phase and it will be challenging more in, in one country and, and maybe less in other countries to build a proper national uh, AFI uh, surveillance system on their own. So it, it's not a matter of building just the regional layer, but also strengthening each country um, uh, system as well. Uh, of course, we were leveraging many of the DHS2 capabilities as the electronic data capture, ideally at the point of care or, or as close as possible. The individual tracking capability, trying not to manage uh, aggregate data as a basis, but uh, to aggregate data afterwards the, regarding or, or um, taking into account which are the indicators that we are trying to build. To focus also on data quality, we all know how challenging it is to, to have uh, good quality in data. And this is also an important matter in terms of international standards, as I mentioned previously. And the goal, of course, is to have good data to build uh, evidence, local-based evidence, because it's not the same to see the figures uh, from, from uh, other uh, high-income countries or other regions and, and to uh, take this evidence and apply it right like that in our uh, region, that could be done, that is done actually uh, by now, but try to develop our own figures, our own um, indicators with uh, local information to make better decisions, to decide what to do with vaccines, uh, if we should prioritize some, uh, some groups or we should uh, avoid some vaccines in some other groups, for example. Um, at the same time, we are trying not to um, increase the burden 
of the countries regarding our demands. Because as a regional office, it's, it could be easy to say, okay, you should send me this information, but then the people in each country, and you do know that, they, don't, uh, they, they have to gather the information, process the information on their own, for their own, but also to send information to this international agency. So we are trying also to uh, make it as easy as possible uh, to exchange this information in an automatic fashion, in an, in an, in an automatic way. Uh, but also within each country, and this is also the reality of many of, of the countries that are present here, there are many other information systems. So we have to foster interoperability to make the, the vaccine safety systems to work along other systems that could be in place, like for example, uh, immunization records or other types of health management information systems. Well, as I said, we uh, work with DHS2. Uh, we, we try to promote it, DHS2, uh, especially at, uh, at the country level. But we understood that as many countries didn't have uh, the proper capacity building to start right away with DHS2, we might have to uh, deploy a regional instance for the Sentinel surveillance. So there are just a group of hospitals across the, the region that are uh, performing active surveillance. And for those hospitals, we created a DHS2 instance with the DHS2 tracker um, module implemented uh, at that level. And these hospitals, even though they are in a country that don't have an information system, an electronic information system in place, they can input data into this system for their own use, but also for uh, the, the reporting uh, task to the Pan American Health Organization for the regional surveillance system, especially for Sentinel or, or active surveillance. Uh, we did some uh, adjustment, adjustment to this uh, AFI package because we understood that it was a, a good starting point, but we would like to, to in enhance those capabilities. So, for example, we uh, included some more variables that were included in the regional in the in the regional uh, manual for ASI uh, for uh, for AFI surveillance, we also uh, try to and we are working on including international standards for uh, coding. For example, for vaccine coding, we are trying to adapt uh, who drug that it's the the standard for pharmacovigilance for for drug names pharmacovigilance, and also Medra that it's an international standard for adverse events uh, codification. Uh, at the same time, we are trying to be open and understand that some other countries might use other standards, for example, ICD-10, ICD-11, SNOMED, and so on. So uh, we are trying not to be like really restrictive in this case, but trying to understand that uh, an international standard, it's a good standard starting point, regardless of which of them they are trying to use or, or they decide to use, because at the end of the day, it's a sovereign uh, decision which uh, standard to use within each country. And finally, we did some minor adjustment regarding the stages of the AFI package or, or the, the workflow that was uh, carrying, uh, that was going on within the, the, the same process. Uh, as I said, we had different installations. Uh, we are working with the, the HISP and, and University of Oslo in the in the regional one but this is going to be like the the mirror where the different countries are going to look for their experience to install their own system as a national information system for a service surveillance of course we had some challenges um the first one and was also mentioned previously is the the governance challenge and one of the aspects is the data governance and the uh, and how the different uh, data and, and information is flowing from one part to the other. As we are an international organization, uh, there and, and with a, quite a history, we do have uh, previous agreements in place, but sometimes those agreements are not uh, that um, detailed in terms of which data sub, uh, should be submitted and which data should not be submitted. And when we are trying to deal with automatic submissions or with electronics exchange, uh, this starts to be really, really, um, uh, we, we need to be really detailed 
on these kind of, of issues. So we are building um, um, memorandums of agreements and, and data sharing agreements with country. So each country can be um, can, can be um, uh, can rely on on those agreements to uh, send information without fearing that this information is going to be misused especially in this uh, in this area that we know could be really really tricky and really challenging because of the uh, so-called anti-vaxxer groups and so on regarding adverse events uh, of course we had the issue of capacity building within each country we are trying to uh, promote the hs2 as a tool and to um, to train people from the from the region you have seen that in many maps of the hs2 implementations America in general is quite white, so we don't have a lot of implementations, but we are promoting it from different uh, projects and, and different aspects, and we, are, uh, we, we know that we, this will change across the, the time. And regarding starting standard terminologies, and this would be uh, maybe quite technical, but we had some challenge within the HS2 because those standards that, that I mentioned, HUDRAG, MEDRA, ICD-11, and SNOMED, I, are quite large uh, data sets. So uh, we, we were used to having maybe ICD codes, and there are uh, 12,000 uh, codes or terms in ICD-10. Then when, when we are moving to ICD-11 or SNOMED or HUDRAG or MEDRA, we are talking about hundreds of thousands. So sometimes it's not that easy to create a, a value set or, or a data set to import right away as an internal catalog because the whole system uh, struggles to deal with it. And also the user experience is not so good because when you are looking for uh, any other concept, sometimes you are not getting what you are trying or what you are searching. So um, maybe, and when we are trying to promote also this discussion, it's a time to uh, build the, the capacity within the HS2 to uh, connect through an API uh, with a uh, terminology server that can manage that complexity as a different system. Uh, but something that we, we also are trying not to build uh, so customized thing for our project because then it's really hard to, to maintain it. And it would be hard also for the countries to maintain such, such a tool. So we are thinking more on having something that could be improved from the core functionality of the HS2, like having these API capabilities and term terminology service as an outsource uh, coming and, and helping me with the terminology uh, data gathering and, and selection. And uh, of course, as I said, the interoperability challenge. Uh, that is connecting not only with the Pan American Health Organization, but also with other systems within the country. As a proposal, as I said, we started with the Sentinel uh, surveillance system, and it's more or less like a software as a service for countries. It's not something that would be used uh, really in, in a wide way, but all uh, uh, just in, in 20 hospitals across the region. So it's a small, small scale, let's say, project. But at the same time, it's a project that will help countries to see how it works in the real life, let's say, using real data from their hospitals and so on. And that's why we started doing this uh, initially in, in test versions, in, in demo uh, instances. So they, they get used to um, inputting data, uh, dummy data initially, in this system. And then we can move forward and start uh, using it with real data. And when they decide that it's a good option to have a national deployment on their own, we can leverage these experiences, these, these lessons learned and best practices from the regional experience uh, to build or to help building their own national implementation uh, with local ownership. This wouldn't be something that the Pan American Health Organization would deploy, but the country itself should deploy as a national system. But as I said, uh, many other countries do have their systems. So uh, we shouldn't, or at least we decided not to go uh, for a custom uh, information exchange for the, for the second phase. We, I said that the first phase with, was really simple, really customized, share your data as it is. And we are struggling trying to aggregate this data now. But for the second phase, uh, using standards and trying to, to uh, uh, keep a structure, 
we decided to build a FIRE implementation guide to, um, to share with all the member states. FIRE is the acronym of FAST Healthcare Interoperability Resources. There, there will be another meeting uh, regarding FIRE and the HS2, so I, I suggest to, to attend that. And the, the decision or, or the, the, um, the reason uh, why we decided to go with this was because in that way, we could not only receive data from uh, from, from systems like DHS2, but also from other systems, Survey and 123, Comcare, custom systems or home ground systems from the, from the countries. Uh, so all of them would benefit from uh, in, in creating this standardized message when sending this information to the Pan American Health Organization. Besides that, they will use this standard to other use cases because they already are doing that. For example, Brazil, Chile, Argentina, of course, the United States, Canada, they are using FIRE for other projects in public health and beyond public health. So there is capacity building regarding this standard to exchange information. So why not using that in public health? Why not promoting that from the Pan American Health Organization? We also know that there are other standards and there is a well-known standard for uh, adverse events reporting, uh, not just for vaccines, but for any other medications uh, for, for uh, pharmacovigilance and it's E2B XML. And this is a, a quite long-standing standard, but it's just for pharmacovigilance. So some, at the beginning, actually, it wasn't fit for uh, vaccines, for example. Uh, so we had to, to adapt it. Uh, somehow. Uh, this is just a figure to show uh, which is the, the, the plan for deploying this in, in different countries. We are working with these countries to, uh, to keep going with the projects for the Sentinel point of view, for the national point of view, and also uh, using their own systems and fire. And uh, I would like to thank all the people, the ones that are here and the, worst, the, the ones that are back home uh, within uh, this project. Thank you very much. Getting up slowly, otherwise I cannot scold you all. There you go. Um, <laughs> Um, our next speaker is actually online, so we're going to test how these mix and match presentations work. So I'm going to stop sharing, and is he a co-host? Suleiman, can you hear us? Oh, hello, you can hear me? Yes. Okay, good afternoon. Good afternoon. I will share my, my uh, screen. Uh, there you are. Do you see it on slide uh, on uh, slide mode? Not yet. Yes. Now yes. Perfect. Okay? Yes. Floor is yours. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I am Suleiman Samake, and uh, I'm DHS2 implementer in East Western Central Africa in Togo. Um, it is a pleasure for me uh, today to present you. Uh, the management of routine immunization data with DHIS2 in Mali, with collaboration with uh, his uh, Mali and the health uh, uh, minister. minister. Um, for the presentation, uh, I will speak about uh, the introduction and some objectives, uh, the methodology, the result about organization of routine API data collections and the uh, data analysis process some difficulties and contrib and uh, some challenges and perspective we have. An introduction, uh, uh, I can say that the API was initiated by the Malian health authorities in 1985 in the line with the WHO's approach to the fight against vaccine preventable diseases. Mali has also followed the evolution of the expansion of the API to other vaccines such as yellow fever, hepatitis B and hemophilus influenza B. In the, the 1980s and 1990s, data were managed mainly through paper uh, copy in health facilities 
and also in the health administration structures. At the end of the 1990s and the beginning of 2000, we saw the beginning of the computerized data management with Excel files. Thus, uh, different API data collection models developed at the national level, like JSON uh, software, and uh, the international level DVD-MT were used for data collection and analysis. These databases were used in the form of application installed locally on a computer. Uh, with the expansion of the internet and the new paradigm of server-based database, offering more possibilities for storing information through the web, Mali has no, not remained on the sideline of this evolution. Third, in uh, December 20. 13, after the evaluation of the routine health information system, in this case, the local health information system commissioned by the National Health Department and conduced with the support of major evaluation founding from USAID, one of the recommendations was to migrate from DSM software to a web-based platform like DHIS2 that could integrate all the data from uh, a different health program. Uh, the objective of this presentation is, uh, in general, objective uh, to outline a, is to outline uh, the organization of uh, routine API data management in DHIS2 to provide suggestions for strengthening the process. Um, specific objective uh, are to explain the organization of API data collection in the routine explain the process of routine API data analysis, identify some challenges, provide perspectives on improving routine API data management through DHIS2. Uh, for do this, uh, to do this uh, work, we've done a, um, we do some uh, a, a, um, a documentary review based on immunization package um, implementation mission report and uh, implementation report of the immunization analysis application and WHO data quality tools, a result of analysis of API data from the national DHIS2 database, web-based article publication, the national health uh, and social information system plan from 2020 to 2024. Evaluation of the mission report on the pilot phase of the electronic registry and uh, about our own, uh, own knowledge for the organization of health information system from the operational to the central level. We have uh, some results to present here. Uh, before DHIS2, before the implementation of the DHIS2, the health information system activity report were provided quarterly in a document called the, the quarterly activity report which was filed out or using primary tools such as the immunization registry, the tally sheets, cold chain temperature record sheet, the monthly API report. There was a first level for the community health center where immunization session were organized and also the second level for the reference health center. Each district compiled the report and of its facility and sent them to the regional level, which in turn compiled the, the, this report for all its districts for the national level. At the district level, another compilation was made by the API officer in DVD-MT. The districts sent their DVD to the regional and so on uh, uh, and, uh, for the national level. The uh, now after DHIS2 implementation, since the start, of the DHIS2 implementation in Mali in uh, 2016, the monthly API report has been set up in the platform. These electronic activity reports uh, are set up through the aggregate component of DHIS2. There was a first level vaccination form for health areas and a second level vaccination form for the referral centers in January 2019, with the revision of the local health information system tools, there is still the first level vaccination form, but no second level form. Information on the logistical management of vaccine is set up in a form assigned to the district office and not to the system has a care unit. This logistical management is also part of the first level forms. The update of the form 
made uh, it made it possible to take into account certain information from DVDMT, namely uh, information on vaccination stations and promotional activities. The immunization farms were also set up in DHIS2. To date, DHIS2 is the primary tool for managing API data in Mali. This was established in 2020 following the integration of the immunization analysis application into the country's national DHIS2 production database. Um, another result about a data analysis process. The CISCOM is the first level of data analysis, particularly the technical director of center, which must ensure that the data collected by immunization agents through the primary media used for uh, to feed the monthly, monthly activity report are consistent. The district is the second level of the analysis for all CSCOM and the region is the third level of analysis. It should be noted that some monthly district meetings are supported by the uh, HIS regional office. The HIS central office uh, is the last level of the data analysis. At the district level, the API focal points are associated with the monthly uh, meetings for their expertise. For the analysis of at the central level, the API is integrated uh, into the DHIS2 technical administration team, which makes it possible to deal effectively with the specificities related to the immunization component. The analysis are currently done on the basis of the data entered in the DHIS2 and the effectiveness of the application of these uh, analysis procedures can be verified through control measures such as supervision, uh, data quality reviews, and other methods. Regarding to the production of statistical yearbook on a, an annual basis, since 2018, the data regarding immunization are taken from DHIS2 like all other programs integrated in the platform. Uh, and the last uh, is the analysis tools uh, used. The, about that, uh, a, pack, uh, a package of dashboard proposed by uh, WHO through the University of Oslo was installed uh, by, uh, by, with the support of uh, Gavi uh, TCA, uh, country TCA. Uh, uh, that, uh, this dashboard was installed in the national production base uh, DHIS2 in 2019 and adapted to the country's needs, needs uh, in terms of indicators analysis. This application of the, the uh, adaptation of the uh, dashboards has allowed the standardization of the analysis carried out at the different levels. The same dashboard is used by the regional and central level, and there is a separate district dashboard for district analysis purposes. A pilot phase of using this dashboard was conducted in the district of Sikasso and Banaba in 2019, and then shared with the rest of the districts. A standardization also made it possible to avoid the anarchic creation of the dashboards by each user in the database. Another uh, analysis tool is uh, immunization analysis app, uh, which is uh, an application created exclusively for the analysis of immunization data in DHIS2 with the ability of automatically generate tables and graphs. It has uh, the ability to generate the same types of performance analysis has uh, in DVDMT, and it offers a set of uh, configurable indicators under the heading RIME indicators which is exported and provided to the WHO in the Afro zone. And the last uh, application here is uh, the WHO data quality tools. About that, the data quality tool in DHIS2 is a cont contribution to a practical approach for improving the quality of the HIS data and using the, the quality tool for potential errors in improved data quality. In many cases, this serves either to modify the data or to improve the data collection system. The implementation of the mode of modern statistical methods and technology, such as the quality of the tool, are important factors in achieving good quality in data or statistics. This application has been integrated into the DHJ2 database, and actors at the national, regional, and district level have been trained on this. Here, this is uh, a dashboard favorite captures 
about vaccination data completeness rate by region and month in 2021. The completeness rate is satisfactory for all month of the year uh, 2021 uh, at the national level. Only the Menaka region has a rate under 80% for 11 months. This could be explained by the deterioration of the security situation in this area. Uh, this is uh, another dashboard favorite capture about timeliness of immunization data by region and month in 2021. The promptitude rate is under 80% for all uh, months overall for the country. And we have some difficulties uh, like geographic coverage of the internet connection network. The internet connection network has some issues in, uh, in some areas. And the COVID-19 pandemic has influenced the implementation of immunization activities at certain levels, not to mention the security, the insecurity in uh, much of the country. We had uh, a, a, also a resistance to change with the pers persistence of the systematic use of access tools by certain API actors. We have some challenge uh, now, uh, like maintain a good level of data completeness throughout the territory and bring the promptitude rate to a satisfactory level and the sustainability of the periodic analysis of data and uh, especially the monthly meeting meetings at uh, uh, the level of the health districts constitute a barometer for monitoring the collection and especially the analysis of the data for decision making uh, above the locality, uh, at both the local and national levels. Uh, we have, so about perspective, we have uh, two, uh, two uh, way here. The first is about electronic vaccination registry. For that, in 2017, there was a combined pilot phase of setting up, setting up an electronic registry for prenatal consultation follow-up among pregnant women and also for vaccination. The experiment was conducted by the Ministry of Health and Public Agent with the support of major evaluation uh, project, and the experience was carried out in the SESCOM home for, of uh, Sanaporoba and Kangaba, and was conclusive according to the process evaluation report. It was therefore recommended that to be, uh, that it be extended to the other districts of the country. This electronic immunization registry has been developed in the tracker component of DHIS2, which is configured on a different production and stuff than the aggregate on which the immunization manual activity report forms exist. To begin with, uh, there will be personal data entry in these electronic registers and also entry the manual activity report forms. There will be a double uh, workload, but when the agents have mastered the use of the system, it would be decided to only fill the electronic register in order to proceed with the automatic filling of the aggregate forms based on the program indicators resulting from the collection uh, of the same information from the tracker. The second perspective is about data transfer. And for that, East, West, and Central Africa has developed an application called data transfer to send data from the individual tracker to the existing forms in the aggregated database. This could be an alternative to double data enter, entry in both the tracker and the aggregate instance. Uh, in uh, conclusion now, uh, the integration of the API into Mali's DHIS2 has strengthened collaboration between immunization and uh, health information system stakeholders in general for better health and data management. Of course, there were difficulties, particularly the persistent use of Excel tools for a given period, but the adaptation of the actors in the system made it possible to switch completely to the DHIS2 platform in terms of routine immunization data management. Thank you. Okay. 
Sorry. <laughs> um, mm, mm, mm. Suleiman, can you stop sharing, please? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, let me share again. Oh, screen one now. I mean, screen one now. No, I'm in screen two. Okay, let me quickly go because we need to catch up on. Voila. Rajab, floor is yours. All right, good afternoon. All right, greetings everyone. So um, my name is Bira Rajab. I head a section within the Ministry of Health in Malawi, Digital Health Division. And I'd like to thank the organizers and everybody and everyone in the room and those connected online for the opportunity for me to make the presentation on our use case, uh, and it's uh, Malawi COVID-19 electronic certificate. Now, this is the outline of my presentation. We'll look at the background, and then we'll look at the vaccine registry, and then we'll look at the COVID-19 e-vaccine certificate, the challenges, and the way forward. So Malawi is a beautiful country are situated in the southern eastern of Africa with a population of 19 million people. And we registered our first case of COVID-19 on the 2nd of April of 2020. And since then, we have cumulatively uh, confirmed about uh, 36,113, which is the most recent, that I took it a few days ago. Uh, as a nation, we adopted the integrated disease surveillance in 2002. All right, so since then, there have been a number of initiatives on IDSR, um, including the introduction of the One Health Surveillance concept. So uh, it's a concept that considers the interconnection between uh, people, animals, and the surrounding, which is the environment. So the picture here depicts what the One Health Surveillance is all about. It's a multi-sector approach where we look at the human, which is IDSR in essence, and then we look at the animal, looking at the various diseases within animals, rabies, et cetera. And we also look at the ecosystem, which is our environment and how they are interlinked. So when we registered the first case of surveillance, uh, efforts were already underway for the One Health Surveillance uh, approach. And this also necessitated the need for us to fast track the human component of the surveillance. Um, and this, um, uh, the One Health Surveillance concept made the country um, uh, mostly divert from the original concept, which was the uh, inter interconnected approach now to focus on how we can enhance syndromic surveillance uh, through a better identification of cases. We looked at how can we prevent further outbreaks of COVID-19 and also most importantly, we use the One Health approach uh, to help us respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we received our first dose of doses of vaccine, uh, about 360,000 doses of AstraZeneca on the 5th of March. Uh, through the COVAX facility. And since then, we, we managed to leverage uh, what we had achieved uh, through the surveillance program, where we had a number of uh, programs defined for surveillance from the port of entry because most cases were imported. And then to case-based surveillance, uh, when we had potential cases, and also to confirmed case management as well as uh, contact tracing. So we customized the COVID-19 vaccine delivery toolkit that was issued by the University of Oslo. Uh, we made it very simple. 
So we had a set of attributes and then we have two stages, which is the vaccination stage and the IFE. Uh, for the attributes are mostly common. Uh, we are looking at the first name, last name, mostly client uh, demographics. And then on vaccination, we had a few sections there. We were looking at the medical history as well as the vaccination information, which included the vaccine given batch numbers, expiry dates, et cetera. Um, for the IFE, we looked at the signs and symptoms uh, uh, medical history, uh, IFE, severity, and investigations. So the electronic vaccine registry was the main tool uh, that we leveraged uh, for uh, reporting all aspect of uh, vaccination. So uh, what we did was to, uh, as I pointed earlier, to customize the DHS2 tracker, and we had to leverage a few generic features of the tracker uh, using the QR code scanning, uh, we had cases where we had a thousand people a day at a vaccination site. And this prompted for us to come up with ways how we can easily manage those uh, numbers uh, to a point where we started leveraging uh, what we have from the National Registration Bureau. Uh, uh, we could scan the QR code that's provided by the National Registration Bureau for us to, uh, to extract uh, some of the demographics so that the process can be a bit quicker to register someone into the system. So the picture on the screen here uh, uh, shows uh, an example of it. Apart from uh, extracting of the QR code information, we also uh, came up with a few program rules. I think from the, uh, from the early sessions of the conference, there was that uh, presentation where uh, we could scan batch numbers of uh, vials and then the information could be extracted. We had a similar approach, but we, uh, we, came, we came into a problem where uh, the vaccine vials uh, had different ways of how the batch, the QR codes were, were encoded. So to iterate on the implementation, we came up with a way that would allow someone to search a batch number and then we could autocomplete using program rules, uh, the various sections within the forms. So as you can see on the screen here, for example, if I, if I select a batch number, the expiry date would populate automatically. And then we also uh, came up with ways how we can autocompute future dates. Um, and it shows on the screen, uh, one way of leveraging the generic features of the capture. So, and then the need came for us to come up with the COVID-19 uh, electronic vaccine certificate. Uh, you know, for the safe movement of people and uh, the population at large, the uh, EPI program, I thought it was a necessary uh, approach to have a credential that would help us monitor the, outbreak, uh, the outro of the vaccines. And then we developed the electronic certificate uh, with an embedded QR code that contains a public key and it securely authenticates and protects the identity of the holder through a private um, key. And through DHIS2 Tracker, uh, we created a user group that would allow uh, verification workflows and approval. So as you can see on the screen, um, on the far right, we have the uh, screenshot of the capture and there are two attributes uh, below the screen, which is the verified and send SMS. Uh, we had challenges setting up the SMPP service in the DHS2 tracker. So we came up with a way through uh, a third party gateway uh, that we could send, we could schedule messages and send. For example, if my record is ready for certification, I just had to go to the tracker and verify by tapping the verified uh, attribute on the screen. And then for the send SMS, I could schedule SMSs. And what you see on the middle is the type of SMS that I would receive. For example, it would, it would, say, um, it would say my name and then where I can download the certificate and also provide the API number, which is a unique system generated number for me to be able to do so. So in essence, the certification workflow, this is how it works. It doesn't usually work the same way. Sometimes you don't get the SMS if you don't have your phone number in the registry. But what will happen is 
uh, someone would authorize and schedule an SMS from DHIS2. And then we have a CVC script that within every minute, it looks uh, in the uh, registry, which is the DHIS2 tracker program for any scheduled SMS. When it gets a notification, it will push the SMS through a third party gateway to the client. So when you receive the SMS, we have a dashboard on covid19.healthy.gov.mw, that's a government domain. And then you would uh, provide your EPI number and then the system through the CVC script would check the record in the DHIS2 and it will pull the record through the tracked entity API and then it will register the record in the uh, script database, the CVC, and then the same will be projected on the screen, which is the dashboard. So in essence, this is what happens. And that's the sample of the certificate when it's generated. Um, so when you scan the QR code, it's a dynamic QR code, um, which takes you to another, uh, which directs you to a website, a web-based application where the system would authenticate the identity of the holder. Uh, we had a few challenges throughout the implementation in the number of iterations, just to make sure the usability of the application, it's where enhanced. Um, from the start up to now, of course, we had we have inadequate mobile devices um, and inadequate personnel to capture the uh, uh, the people who are getting vaccinated. Uh, the demand was just quite enormous for a single person to register around 800 people a day. Uh, as a result, we have a huge backlogs of data that we are capturing retrospectively, and then. Uh, as we were deploying the CVC application, I think this is a comment per se. We, um, we, were, deploy we were developing the application using version uh, 2.357. And then when we, sorry, we were developing using a test instance on 2.35.8. Uh, uh, by the time we were planning to go in production, uh, the, the instance that we had in production was running 2.35.7. And then we realized the tracked entity endpoints were broken by then. Um, and then uh, by the time we upgraded to uh, with uh, a point one, which is the 2.35 again on production, we are back online. So this shows exactly how brilliant and vibrant the community is and how issues are resolved in time. Um, connectivity has been a challenge uh, to a point where we have a few arrangements with the MNOs where we are able to uh, do a reverse billing. So you would use the connectivity, the mobile networks for free, and then we are built on the central, uh, with a central mechanism where we are paying uh, through the ministry. Now, there's another issue of incentives. Um, so there are different campaigns on vaccination. So for example, UNICEF, through support from uh, UNICEF, uh, we have the uh, finish the vial approach where the HSAs, uh, they are allowed to finish uh, a vial and the incentives associated with that approach. Um, so the data person is left out uh, through, that, uh, through that arrangement. So for you to get someone who is data oriented to capture the vaccination data, it's quite difficult knowing that the colleague is getting incentive while he's not. So that's another challenge. Uh, as a way forward, um, we are planning on developing fire compliant resources to connect our local instance of the CVC um, to other initiatives, uh, regional and global. And then we're also thinking of connecting the, uh, the database to the National Registration Bureau system because we are already extracting the national ID uh, from the uh, from the, uh, the cards into our database, which is DHIS2, we are thinking of how we can extract other biometric information to enhance security. And then we are thinking of expanding the use case, the lessons uh, to a registry where we can accommodate all other vaccines. And this goes without mentioning some partners and uh, funders who have been here who have been supporting us through the, uh, the implementation with uh, clearing the backlogs to the actual technical support. And this marks the end of my presentation. Thank you.
Right. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening, uh, everyone. So uh, I'm Pamod uh, from His Sri Lanka. Uh, I was initially supposed to present about uh, data quality in vaccination, but uh, because our Ministry of Health colleagues from Sri Lanka could not join, I'll be also uh, presenting on the COVID immunization tracker, and I will combine it with the data quality assessment. Right. So uh, a little bit of background about what happened in Sri Lanka and uh, uh, during the pandemic. We'll be talking more about it tomorrow in the plenary session. So uh, in a nutshell, um, from the start of the pandemic, uh, we were able to produce a, a kind of a DHS2 based ecosystem uh, for surveillance, uh, where we were able to design about 10 modules uh, on top of DHS2 platform in like a four months period. So this involved a lot of capacity building and uh, a stakeholder engagement. And we were able to take this forward uh, uh, following the initial six months. So that was the time when we were uh, more focusing about whether we can actually routinize uh, whatever we, we initiated during the initial times of the pandemic. So this was when uh, uh, the discussions around whether incorporating uh, immunization data in DHS2 was possible. Now I'm talking about latter part of 2020, and we were able to uh, quickly customize DHS2 again uh, for our immunization data capture just before we uh, received the first set of uh, COVID vaccinations. So this was again in late January, uh, late December, early January 2021. Right, so uh, just to highlight uh, the, the, all the modules that we have in the COVID, uh, COVID DHS2 COVID surveillance package and immunization is just one of them. I just want to highlight this because it's, uh, it has so many other components. Right, so what do we have in uh, DHIS2 COVID vaccination or COVID immunization tracker, uh, as we call it in Sri Lanka? Uh, so again, like, uh, just like the surveillance, we were the first country uh, in the DHIS2 implementation world to, uh, <laughs> thank you, to uh, use uh, DHIS2 for COVID uh, data capture. Uh, so the components that we have, uh, first thing is the tracker, the immunization tracker, it's a registry, and then the stock monitoring component, which is aggregate component, and then uh, the vaccination certificate and a citizen portal for the appointments. So uh, the aggregate data, again, it's a simple form uh, to capture the stock data. And of course, the major component is about the tracker, where we have the immunization uh, tracker. It's, a, it's, as you know, like it's a simple uh, customization uh, of the DHS2 tracker, uh, but but we have done some slight modifications to the uh, tracker capture application for a, for a, for the uh, integration of the certification component, which I will explain in a while. And in addition, we also capture AEFI information, and we also have a pregnant COVID-19 vaccination uh, cohort, which is captured separately outside of this uh, tra uh, tracker. I mean, uh, it's complementary, but it's managed by uh, by our MCH program. And also uh, analysis and visualization of uh, COVID uh, immunization data. Uh, so we used uh, the existing avail uh, available analytic tools in DHIS2. And also we use dashboards. We kind of uh, export data as Excel. And we are also using SQL weaves in certain, uh, certain situations where existing analytic tools have some limitations. Right, so about uh, vaccine certificate. Uh, so there was a lot of discussions uh, within our his community as well as a few other stakeholders uh, globally. Uh, so our initial version of uh, COVID certificate uh, we produced, I mean, at, by the time we implemented our immunization tracker back in 2021, January, but that did not have this cryptographically verifiable component. Uh, so what we actually did was we uh, kind of uh, uh, modified the DHS to tracker capture, and we also have some backend component uh, going. Uh, that's how we initially implemented the uh, first version of the vaccine certificate. And also, uh, we had this interim guidelines, uh, which has been getting updated uh, time to time. Uh, this was the guiding document uh, that we initially referred, and then uh, this was our kind of initial uh, version of the certificate. Right. And then, uh, to complicate things a bit more, but to make it more, uh, uh, how would I say, technologically standard, we use uh, DIVOC, which is again a uh, digital public good uh, and used in India uh, for to producing uh, COVID-19 certificates. So what we did was to create an integration. So this is kind of a technical uh, workflow of how data flows between all these components. And finally, we have DHIS2 and DIVOC integrated together to produce the COVID uh, vaccination certificate. 
Right. Um, I'm mindful of time, so, and I want to keep some time for Q&A. So I'm going a little bit fast. I hope you don't mind. So uh, back to the COVID immunization campaign and where it is standing now. So the COVID immunization campaign was a countrywide immunization campaign, which we had to organize rapidly and deploy it rapidly. So this word rapid is very crucial because uh, it was not like any other vaccination campaigns we have uh, conducted before. We had to customize when it comes to, I mean, I'm, I'm leaving aside all the complexities around, uh, I mean, distributing vaccine and conducting the vaccination campaign. I'm only referring to the uh, data component. So we had to customize the solution, which is uh, in this case, DHS2, and do some trainings in midst of pandemic, all online, and then deploy the system. And we also had multi-sector collaboration, again, just like what we initially experienced uh, with the COVID uh, surveillance component. So we had the Ministry of Health and other ministries, including the National ICT Agency of Sri Lanka, who was kind of uh, communicating and um, organizing all other stakeholders. And we also had WHO country office who kind of played a major role in supporting with the technicalities of uh, configuring the tracker and this uh, certificate and things like that and also the military. Because uh, in Sri Lanka, uh, uh, all the vaccination camp, uh, centers, uh, these are kind of temporary establishment, data entry support is provided by the Air Force and the Navy, right? So we have Air Force and Navy personnel in all vaccination centers, not to do anything else, but to uh, enter data, uh, up to date. Right, so right now, uh, Probably we, we are implement, I mean, this is the largest DHS2 based tracker or, or else one of the largest. So we have 20 million people registered. Mind you, our population is just uh, 21 million. There are some duplicates here, <laughs> <laughs> some. Uh, and we have 40 million plus uh, vaccination events and 160 million plus attributes. Like these attributes are, are like properties of uh, all these, uh, I mean, uh, people who are registered in the system. And then we also uh, issue vaccination certificates for all, all the travelers. So that is why this is one of the most crucial systems in Sri Lanka right now, because uh, I mean, the moment if you have some technical issues uh, uh, on this system, I mean, we all get notifications and uh, calls and I mean, like, so it's, it's very complex uh, and uh, there's a lot of attention to this system. Right, uh, so what is it all about data quality of this uh, vaccination tracker? The thing is like, this is a countrywide implementation, which is not really planned in, a, in, a, in, in our, I mean, traditional way. So usually even, uh, I mean, the vaccination campaigns are well-planned across a couple of months. And when it comes to information systems, we kind of implement it uh, uh, gradually, like probably in one, one, two districts, provinces, not uh, kind of like countrywide implementations. So it was a rapid, implementation so there was no proper testing we were just relying on and we are we were we were having we were actually trusting the data into people and the uh, health staff uh, at field level because they were really supportive of our uh, implementation before and we had multi-sector engagement so I, I i told you like it was not just uh, health staff who were already familiar with the dhs2 system so we have our health, field health staff like midwives and public health inspectors who are, who are usually, I mean, who have been using DHS2 for so many years. But here we are talking about security personnel. Uh, I mean, okay, here you go. Like you have a system, please enter data. How we did that was like we provided them with the one page uh, user document and we had a YouTube video. So you, you are supposed to kind of uh, study that and probably uh, have, uh, again, um, have some peer learning and then uh, enter data. And also we wanted to do some research around this uh, large amount of data uh, captured in the DHS2 tracker. And again, like we have routine many activities which are there in our public health implementations, but we were kind of doing some fast track uh, uh, implementation here. So uh, it was kind of bypassing some of these uh, check, uh, I mean like checks and stuff that, that were already in place. So this is why we had to uh, focus on the data quality. So to do that, uh, we uh, did the assessment which had, which had two components. One is the quantitative part and the other one is uh, the qualitative. So in the quantitative, we were mostly focusing about uh, the completeness and timeliness. Of course, the accuracy and validity part uh, is, is, is happening as of now. So this is not a completed, I mean, not a complete study as yet. 
Uh, so to do that, what we do, what we did was we used the existing analytic tools of DHIS2 to assess uh, some of these uh, criteria. And sometimes we used triangulation. So we have the data captured in DHIS2. So we always have to compare it with another uh, source of data. So what we use is that we have this aggregate data that is coming to the epidemiology unit about how many vaccinations were conducted uh, from each vaccination center. So we kind of use that to triangulate. And then we also use some custom scripts to uh, pull data from the DHS to database to do specifically this timeliness assessment was uh, done like that. And we also did some qualitative assessments based on uh, interviews and observations, uh, I mean, throughout the country. Right, so this is what we have uh, for completeness. So what you are seeing here is like completeness as a percentage for total vaccination doses, first doses, second doses, and third doses. Mind you, this is tracker data, right? So this is individual vaccination events and not aggregate data which you are entering at the end of the day. So individual patient records, uh, I mean, each vaccination event was recorded and we have around 87% completeness uh, for this individual data, which uh, in our opinion and our experience uh, uh, from pre previous tracker implementations is very impressive to get 87% completeness, uh, uh, I mean, within like a couple of months. Uh, and we also note that uh, for the first dose, it's like, now almost 90% and uh, when it comes to the third dose, it's less. So that means like to achieve a good level of completeness, it might be taking some time because we are already done with the first dose. Uh, so probably that's why we have uh, around 90%. Right, it, uh, it gets more interesting when it comes to timeliness. So what you are seeing here is like, we are assessing the timeliness, like when was the data entered? So we are comparing the vaccination date, the date actually the actual vaccination happened and date it was entered into the DHS2 system. So uh, it's quite interesting to note that we have close to 30% of the data which is entered on the same day. That means it's kind of like real time data entry. So we have around like 30%, one third of data which is uh, entered real time. And we have like, uh, I mean, this uh, same day combined with uh, two days or less. It's, it comes to almost 40%. So like whatever the data that is entered within two days means like, so why people are not capturing data the same day, we have just uh, looked into the issue. So the thing is like in some, some cases you don't have uh, good infrastructure, internet coverage and things like that. So they prefer to, have, uh, to maintain their Excel or paper records and go back to the facility and enter data. But data coming, this individual data coming in two days is impressive and really good enough for us. So up to 40% of the data we are getting in like uh, uh, two days time. And within two weeks or less, like so uh, almost two thirds of the data, uh, looking at this uh, chart, we see that like, uh, we'll be able to get it within like two weeks. So two thirds of uh, vaccination data, which again, uh, we felt was good enough for a campaign which was uh, rapidly deployed. And then uh, uh, there are some instances where we, it takes months for, for us to get data. So these are areas where you have some governance issues and some issues related to infrastructure and things like that. And you may also notice that there's here, the negatives. So this again is some data quality issues. Uh, so negatives means there's an issue with the dates, right? So this happened, we are, we are trying to figure out what really happened, but this is very less. Uh, much less than 1% of the data that is there. So this, this uh, we, we figure out it's something to do with uh, the initial imports and things like that we, we did uh, uh, in the initial few months of the uh, uh, implementation, right? Okay, so uh, uh, the qualitative data, the positives, there were a lot of positives. So for example, uh, configuration of uh, tracker program, like things like program rules really helped us to achieve the data quality. So we, we made it so structured that people don't really make mistakes. And availability of dashboards to supervisors was really helpful so that they can always figure out if something is wrong, right? They can always reach out to the people who are entering data and try to figure out what went wrong. Uh, there are areas to improve. For example, uh, uh, we had like, I mean, the thing is like, we had so many different types of users entering data. So that was very complicating. It would have been ideal if we only had uh, health uh, staff entering data, but uh, that's life. And then we also have lack of supervision because we were kind of fast tracking uh, some many uh, mechanisms which are already in place. And then we also uh, noticed some gaps in capture interface, which we are trying to improve. 
And uh, then like some localized governance issues when it comes to pro providing um, um, like uh, some infrastructure and uh, guidance on entering data. So these were some areas that were lacking. So finally, in conclusion, uh, we believe like we were able to achieve high levels of completeness and timeliness. Accuracy data pending, probably uh, in a couple of months we'll be having that data. And there's of course scope for improvement in our uh, current configuration, the way we implemented. And we have already uh, put some, I mean, uh, taken some measures to improve that. And uh, monitoring and evaluation around data quality should be established for case-based data. It is already there for aggregate, but there are some gaps when it comes to uh, case-based data implementation. And then uh, of course we need uh, future research on routinization. I mean, yes, COVID was like uh, a major focus. There was a lot of attention. But like, uh, are we able to establish the same when it comes to routine immunization data? It's a question uh, which has to be answered in future. So thank you very much. I must especially thank all the stakeholders who supported and the Ministry of Health especially. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pamod. And of course, Rajab, I just wanted to save as much time as possible in between you two talkers. And I hope you also understood why I was so very excited when I saw uh, Sri Lanka submitting the abstract. I mean, a follow up after one year doesn't happen all the time. And uh, I think it was quite worth it to have a highlight there. We literally have five minutes left. And if anyone has a question, is your time. Or you can, of course, okay, there you go. Um, of course, you can also post questions on the community of practice as well. And uh, for those who are here, I mean, you can just like literally tackle people in the corridor and force them to answer questions as well. Um, I'll get there in one second. Hello. Okay. Uh, thanks. My name is Patricia. I'm working uh, with the WHO um, Hub for Pandemic and Epidemic Intelligence, and I'm also working with the Digital Health and Innovation uh, Department back at HQ in Geneva. Um, all interesting presentations, so thank you. I had a specific question for Malawi. Um, I was curious about um, the development of the COVID-19 e-certificate. Uh, we developed a DDCC guideline, so it's the Digital Documentation for COVID-19 Certificate wondering whether this guideline was used at leverage during the development of that certificate and also in the presentation there was a mention of next steps being um, the development of fire um, resources for COVID-19 certificate and I believe that that's something we have developed as well um, just not to duplicate work just in case if you if you need that I'm happy to put you in touch with the team. Right. Um, thanks for the wonderful questions. Is it audible? Yeah. So for the for the implementation of the CVC COVID nineteen vaccine certificate, we followed the the virtual guidelines, um, and we had to submit the same to the um, to the United Kingdom for them to start accepting the certificates as people were traveling to the UK. So uh, we did follow the guidelines. As for the fire compliant. Um, APIs, we, we are thinking of how we can connect the instance of the CVC to the rest of the world. So for example, DHIS2 gives us the generic APIs, which are not fire compliant per se. I know there's the adapter, we didn't leverage that. So yeah, we could also look at the, the WHO, uh, what you have developed and see how we can leverage from uh, those synergies. Thank you. In that case, I declare it over and you guys are all free, but thank you so much for coming here and thank you so much for, for, for 
uh, our presenters. And remember that now we have the group picture. So please don't run away. And uh, only after that, if you remain for the picture, you can have the cocktail. Otherwise, you can't.